Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. Uh, we're asking about uh, whether or not all those new gizmos like those unveiled Tuesday in Cupertino, California at the headquarters of Apple rule our world and uh, how much uh, do we have control over all the data we're giving away for free. We're talking about it with Emmanuel Vivier. He's the co-founder of the digital uh, think tank, uh, the Hub Institute. Uh, w welcome back. Welcome back as well to intellectual property attorney Etienne uh, Drouard. Uh, Jakob Hessler, co-founder of Tiny Clues, Tiny Clues, which does big data. And uh, Liam Bogart, uh, whose startup blog is called Rude Baguette. Uh, lots of reactions coming in. One from Alex saying privacy is part of freedom. We should thus fight for both, both privacy and freedom. Uh, Jakob Hessler, uh, Google this Tuesday, uh, speaking of privacy, kicking off a tour of European capitals in Madrid, spinning those encounters uh, as debates on the balance between privacy and the free flow of information. This after a court ruling back in May in Brussels, upholding Europeans' rights to be forgotten online. For critics, this, of course, looks like a public relations tour. And I know that in your native Germany, the issue of privacy is a topical one. Yeah, very much so. I mean, and the question is a legitimate one. And people raise it, and then they use the means that they have. So today, it's the European Commission that issues a new regulation. The question is always a debate between technical feasibility of that famous right to forget, the question about what does informational self-determination really mean. And of course, on the other hand, for Google, having to change or mod modify its business model for a continent is something they probably would rather avoid if, so, they, so if they can. But, you know, let's see how it plays. So of are the Germans right to fight for the right to be forgotten, and can they do it? Well, it's not just the Germans. It's not just the Germans. I think it's the European Union. I think the idea of the right to forget is not bad. I personally am not exactly sure how how it will really well, work. Have you, have you seen the examples of, of what, I mean, what, what, Google has made light mm. of some of the lesser great examples. Most of them are people who are trying to make bad things they've done be forgotten. And so the idea that uh, criminals can make their criminal past go away because it was a white collar crime and they don't want that to come up when people Google search them is is a relatively questionable task. I mean, well, considering yeah. people use Google as a way to remember what they know. Not sure, though, because, you know, in the traditional jurisprudence, once you've committed a crime, you have it on your personal dossier for, and there's a certain number of years when you consult it, it's still there, and then it becomes, society declares it clean again, mm -hmm. in a way. And the question is, it's always the same thing. It's like, how do we translate practices that societies have evolved over centuries yeah, but into you're the digital you're world now in a few years. You're treating Google like the digital government. They're not the no, digital government. They're just the representation of what people know. So if the only thing you've done in the last 15 years is this terrible crime and you haven't <laughs> you haven't actually wiped crazy your clean your digital footprint by doing something noteworthy, then maybe that's what you should be remembered for, like a like a tombstone. If the last thing you did was terrible, then that's what you're going to be remembered for. Etienne Trois. The first mistake from the European Court of Justice was to not only create this right to be forgotten for the first time effectively, because it was in a draft regulation which is still mm -hmm. under debate, but with this decision it gives a, a, Jurisprudence. Yes, a birth of this right to be forgotten. But there is a mistake. Uh, the balance between privacy and access and freedom of information has not been made by the European Commission. It has to be made between yourself your request to Google and the legitimate purpose for which you would like the information to be forgotten. There will be no judge, no court. And the first mistake is that the European Supreme Court has asked Google to answer these people without any social control yes. and debate on how it should be balanced. It has always been balanced between freedom yeah. of speech and privacy. It has always been uh, involving a court or a judge and this is the end of this. So we put all the debate in the hands of myself and Google and That's a committee of experts enough. which should decide whether or not five years is good, two years is good, a crime is a, gr a crime or not. And this is not a matter of privacy. This is a matter of a collective um, yes. remember Structuring the yeah, public sphere. Structuring all right, so, so the structures structuring aren't the there. But uh, when Liam Bogart says that Google is not the internet government, in effect, if the structures are weak, it is. 
Mm. Yes, because yeah, that's that's due to be. lack of government. That's yeah, like saying that the be. Belgian government. It's it's they 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 are the de facto. Uh, uh, medium because there is no government. The problem is that there's no digital savvy in the government. There is no lean government the way there's a lean startup. And so people people expect gov uh, Google to uphold some sort of governmental responsibility and to be impartial when in reality they're a service provider. They're a very well used and very present in our daily lives service provider. But what they say, you can use our service to find what you're looking for. In turn, we, we use your searches for money. When I was talking about a mistake, it's that, is that a Supreme Court designated Google to do it, which yeah. is which is the end of the public power yeah. Yeah. provided by the public power to an international market player. Yeah. Uh, and and, and yes, it's a, you abandon the power you had and because you have someone more efficient, faster in, in its decision yeah. and, and cheaper than having a lawyer and a judge deciding what, what to do with a, with a question. But that's precisely the whole problem is, is that we haven't found as societies the locus where the debate is supposed to happen. Is it at national, regional, international level? I mean the government-sponsored debate and the question about what jurisdiction applies and how should we construct a digital jurisdiction. I mean, we can the same thing for ICANN. Yes, I mean, it's a, they, they ICANN, get, which is the organization that uh, regulates the internet on the yeah, world scale. It's, 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 it's a first attempt of having something supranational of some sort, but it's just we haven't really, I think, thought about it enough. We haven't like debated a, it publicly enough to see what will emerge. And we closed this debate quickly by giving it over to Google. And I think that was a big, it's a big mistake. And it's a big burden on Google, too, because then everyone will hold them responsible for something that they shouldn't be responsible. Well, what we need is a, a digital Geneva Convention. Yeah. We need some sort of agreement that people make. This is what's OK. This, is, sure. this isn't. The problem is people aren't educated enough to make those decisions. Yes. So they'd rather say Google should invest money mm -hmm. in doing, in, in you know, appeasing our fears. And appeasement works great in Europe, from what I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> the the first uh, Emmanuel Didier, let me ask you, if you do have this digital Geneva Convention mm -hmm. where you set out more uh, consensual world rules on the Internet and on all these questions of privacy, who holds the gavel? Who has the final say in the decisions? Uh, I think first, in our talk, we talk a lot about uh, the West, like US and Europe, but we tend to forget that there's Asia. And if we look at the other side of the world, in China, for example, uh, they have a diff very different way of looking at privacy and freedom of speech, uh, which is their own. Uh, it's a different culture. So uh, if it's a Geneva Convention, it needs to be worldwide. It's going to be very hard to uh, get country as different as China and US and Europe uh, to agree on those. And yeah, but that's the advantage of glo the globalized economy is everyone more or less has an interest in, in agreeing, getting along. China and does business with the US, they do yeah. business with Africa, they do business with Europe, and Europe does business likewise with everyone else. It's like the, the other side like is to have all these people agree on, on this. I'm afraid it's not for tomorrow, this Geneva no. Convention, because states no. don't want it because it would be a matter to control their sovereignty and their digital uh, cyber security policy. Well, we, we need it, but first we need a digital war before we can have a digital con Geneva there Convention. Is, <laughs> there is, and the second category of population that doesn't want it is the global market players. They don't want a UA, UNO convention on how to re rule freedom of speech, intellectual property, privacy well, issues. Well, that's right, not so true, because Google's openly said that if the Euro if Europe, this is more related to fiscal policy, you, Google's often in hot water around yeah. where they pay taxes and where they funnel their money. Um, that's not true, they don't funnel, they follow the law. Uh, they've said that as long as Europe has a rule that doesn't just apply to Google, there are very often Google taxes that are proposed by local legislature, government, uh, you know, country legislature. Right. They said as long as everyone is on the same page and everyone's on the same scale, they have no problem. They just want to, there just is no rules and they're doing what they want. And they're saying, if you set up a set of rules that everyone agrees to, we're fine with that. Just give us one rule yeah. and don't constantly throw things yeah. like the right to be forgotten or, or taxing on digital goods or making it illegal to be an Irish company or whatever they want to throw out. Yes, so, but the issue is, uh, should we um, uh, regulate Google or not? The issue is, should we regulate the internet, including Google? I don't think it's. I don't think the Geneva Con Convention regulates war. I think it just. No, I no. Think it just sets, try I think to harmonize just, principles, I mean, and when it's you true say, that we are not. We are we not should, on the same. And when you say we need a digital war, what do you mean? All I'm, the coming back to the Geneva Convention metaphor, the Geneva Convention was set up to to make sure I'm that we don't have. Yes, but I'm not sure that the 
uh, Russians, French, Chinese, uh, Brazilians, and uh, and in the U.S. are not ongoing on a on a cyber war uh, about sure, but it doesn't affect citizens. economic intelligence. Sorry, it doesn't. I mean, do you feel like your day to day right, is affected? Something that, let's I, talk about let's talk yeah. about something that does affect citizens. Um, it, it's an item now being sold <laughs> by French clothing brand Gemo. Get ready for it. The winter coat for kids with a built-in GPS. The device requires a subscription. Um, it inspired uh, Le Monde's journalist to quote uh, the sociologist Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Uh, there you see uh, that device uh, being put in the in, inside of the jacket of your child so you can know where they are. Psychologically, what kind of effect is something like that going to have on kids growing up? We don't know, but uh, technology is there, the price is cheap, and uh, there is a need. Does this hearten you or scare you? Uh, the first question would be, does it scare your son? And as a parent, do I want it for him? Uh, because I cannot compare him and I, because, because this appears now. So the effect on the new generation is just not under control at all. We don't know. But I'm sure that uh, they will find some solutions to escape from their parents. And we will try to have more pressure on them. So they will have a watch and they will have something they cannot escape to. So at the end of the day, if we want to push security on our children uh, further and further, we should implement them a chip in the arm. Like the dogs, I think it's even better. You have a <laughs> yes. Why yeah. not? But it's yeah, I, I joking, not sure that that is. joking, that joking aside, Jakob Hessler, are we headed for this dystopia that we, we were hearing? Well, I, I think. The, I, well, I think the. I'm not sure whether the, the the biggest problem of this dystopia is knowing via GPS where your six year old child is or eight year old child is. The real dystopia about education, having myself uh, a, a young daughter, is to see the frenzy with which parents tend to want to control and basically make sure that they get into Harvard at age three and for getting into a school you hire a consultant. That's the real social problem around education. They're ready to pay for security. I, I, would, I would think. Yeah, but if you look at what people are ready to pay for, I mean, what happens when someone finds a way to hack into the security company that's supposed to tell you where your kids is, reproduce <laughs> that GPS signal and kidnap your kid and you don't know for hours because now you're relying on technology instead of just relying on what you used to which was eyeballs and yeah. friends but look <laughs> from the kids perspective maybe if you have the, cho the choice between having your mother 24 hours a day with you or she knowing where you are but at least leaving you alone uh, maybe they will prefer to be I, tracked and be alone and i think literally giving... billions of children have grown up without either of those mm -hmm. in the history of time i think we've managed to get by which which yeah. implies that we'll manage to continue to do it and I agree that there's a sentiment of over of this, you know, fear and, and wanting to be overbearing. I think it's more of a trend, and I don't think the future is we know where everyone. I don't think that's a, a positive way for the future to go. All right, let, let me speak to that father of that three-year-old daughter uh, again here, uh, Jakob. You were ta telling us in part one about the fact that we look at our at our mobile devices. What is it? You said 162 times. 162 times a day. Um, our children do their homework with their devices or social network while they're while mm -hmm. while they're doing other things. How different will their psyche be from ours? See, the honest answer is we don't know. I think the we, we know some research on attention span and how the fact that if you interrupt concentration too often, actually your ability to learn goes down. That we do know. There's some research about that. But for all the rest, we just don't know. And that's probably the most difficult part to accept. We don't know. Uh, and the society hasn't yet developed the cultural techniques. Imagine when the first printed book came out, right? In, you know, in the, and suddenly there was this guy in Belgium, in Antwerp, printing, uh, Plantin Moretus, printing all these pamphlets for the emperor for the counter-reformation. Suddenly the world was flooded with print words everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. They had no clue whether and how that would evolve and who would read and how you would read. It was just there and it just takes time. And, and, and I think we should just 
we have a we should be cautious but we should let things evolve and equip ourselves with the ability to continuously judge monitor and say what we want and today we are either in panic or we're in naive embracing this is the greatest thing since the invention of sliced bread and we need something more reasonable in between and then some things will turn out to be good and others will be not so good and then you know I em Emmanuel Vivier, <coughs> I want to ask you as a Frenchman um, these companies that uh, do these social networking uh, applications mm -hmm. most of them are American do you sense an anti-Yankee backlash I don't know. I think there's fantasies that people will uh, leave Facebook. It was like for, for a few months, this type of news. Honestly, they just go for the best app. If it's useful to them, you know, they vote with their feet or they vote with their money. If they have to, have to but, pay but for But what do you think apps. of the tone of the rhetoric that we're hearing here in France when it comes to things like Facebook and... Oh. And Amazon. If, if we look at the number, people are using Amazon uh, 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 every year uh, even more. They are still uh, on Facebook and, and it's still uh, uh, growing. So, yeah, there is yeah. sometimes... In the, France, the France had its shot in social networks. Yeah. We had Copain de Vent and we had yeah. Viadio and the consumers decided. They had the choice between Copain de Vent oh. and Facebook. Yeah. And I would say it would be more on a, with the NSS scandal uh, that... Okay, companies or maybe government are having a wake-up call. But I think for the users, you know, they are mm -hmm. using their phones, they are using Instagram, they are using Facebook, they are using Snapchat. Everything that is useful to them, they, they really use it. They don't really care if it's American, Chinese or, or Japanese or Israeli or uh, whatever. For them, you know, it's just an app, it's just a tool, like made in China, made in the U.S. Yeah, there will be some people that are maybe more educated that know that, okay, we're giving our data as to uh, foreign companies, but I think for yeah, the but, end user, no way. But you have to really redefine care. what a foreign company mm -hmm. is because everything's so distributed. Yep. For example, the, the largest manufacturer of blog technology, I run a blog so I'm familiar with it, is called WordPress. And the company behind it is what's called a distributed company, which means they have no office. Their employees are wherever they want to be, and I think they have employees in almost every country in the world. So when they put something out and you give them your data, are you giving your data to an American company? Is the government really involved? Does, it, does nationality really come into play? Yeah. For Google, for example, they developed their iOS application in Paris. So does that mean when I use Google for iOS that I'm giving data to, uh, to okay, French th employees? That, that, that's the, the reality of what's going on on the ground. But there's also the perception, and this is the yes. question. And that perception, and there is an anti-globalization backlash in this country. Oh, yes. It's about of culture and uh, easiness. Uh, culture because we would like these marketplaces to be inspired by the European culture on democracy. But on the privacy side, on the fact that there was a war, a need for privacy protection, the Stasi in, in Germany, etc. This is a part of our history, which means that it's not the Chinese history, this is not the US history. And we have the, this problem of harmonizing our approach with the, our cultural approach with that. But for regulators, it's very comfortable to say that it's a foreign company because they have an enemy for a long time. It's, and this is wonderful for them to claim, shout, and not being efficient. So they can, they can blame it on the Americans when they have their own problems. Which brings no, us to another topic. Uh, you're talking about uncharted territory. Next Monday, another U.S. giant opens shop on French soil. Netflix, the home movie and TV subscription service seen by many French as a threat to their homegrown entertainment industry. Even though Netflix plans to shoot it, a French version of House of Cards that will be set in the southern port city of Marseille. One survey warns that um, French TV fiction could lose 24% of its financing and cinema up to 22% between now and uh, 2017. Uh, Jacob Hessler, the, the, uh, the arrival of Netflix has France's whole entertainment industry worried. Yeah, and in part, rightly so. And in part, I think there's a big confusion about there's a platform, it is efficient and digital, it gives consumers what they want, and the fact that there are mechanisms, traditional mechanisms that are from the era of when people still went to movie theaters, that raise money through which the government wants to incite the production of goods it considers culturally superior. And those two can be and have to be separate. And I think the real problem in France is, is that too many of those who produce supposedly culturally superior goods for fear 
uh, and for inability of switching and embracing a digital mindset think that they can combat it. And by doing so, they are undermining their, in, in their ability to actually play on that platform. Because if suddenly you have every French film available, I know many people in America who are Truffaut film fans. Yes, there's, there's, let, let that be 0.00001%. They can watch it because the French content becomes accessible on the tip of a button, and they will. So, but if you don't make this accessible because you say the digital world is bad and we have to resist it as long as we can, and instead the cultural policy is to subsidize newspaper stands with inefficient distribution of paper newspapers, you know, where you can't get more than three FTs on a Saturday morning because then the guy doesn't get delivered more papers. See, that's what they focus on. And they shouldn't. They should embrace this and then people... Well, don't forget the fact that the French cinema industry isn't profitable. It loses money every year. Yeah, they, looked at, they looked at how yeah. much money the government puts into the industry and how much revenue it but generates. But it exists, contrary to the German yeah. one. But fair, no, I'm not saying... Yeah. But, but it becomes... It's not an economic issue as much as it is a social issue. It's a we political produ question. It's like, we produce it's French film and then, yeah. then Luc Besson brings Scarlett but, Johansson and fixes... No, Etienne it, 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 Roir, will Netflix change France forever? Spend. Uh, I'm not sure, Stupid. but it, it is, I mean, Stupid. it's a good moment to, to, to come to France and create this debate and try to change chain, the chain of distribution. I'm not sure that the problem is the availability of this cultural content, because it's mm. already available. The problem is the price and the pocket in which the price goes. So when it changes, it may change the chain of production. So we know that there is a direct effect between uh, the changing the, the distribution, the distributors. Because right now French cinema they're... is largely subsidized by pay TV uh, subscriptions. Yes. But look at and Deezer is a French company. Nobody is saying that it's a French problem that the rise of Deezer and Spotify has completely changed the economics of the music industry. Yes, it but just Canal happens. Plus is very important in France yes, of course, for production, but, but also for uh, availability of contents through internet service providers. Well, also Canada Plus has a competitor to Netflix, so they have a direct interest in Netflix not coming here. So does Orange, which is why Orange agreed not to distribute yes, Netflix to its customers. Yes, this is what I say. So there is a relation between distribution and production. Yes. All right, so uh, again, we're, we're talking about uh, uncharted territory. And again, we're talking about not it's not just cultural quid pro quos. There is a political element to all of this. There is this... Uh, uh, problem between Europe and the United States that seems to be growing. But I think we don't have the same link to innovation. Uh, it's a problem Europe. within Europe. I don't think it's a problem we have with the United States. I think we have a problem with ourselves because we are hunting these, these chimères of, and by doing that, we lose the edge by saying, so what are we good at? And how can we, you know, it's a political decision to say you want to subsidize cinema. But it's a relationship to innovation. It's basically in, in Europe, we are really wait and see. And, you know, let's look at all the danger. And maybe if we find a solution for all of them, maybe we'll do the thing. I think in the U.S., they're really test and learn. You know, it's, it was the far, far west be, before. They are ambitious. They try things. They fix things when it doesn't work or when you have to, to find some low. We forbid stuff, and it's really hard for innovation to, to come up. So as soon as we see something new and innovative, it looks dangerous. And, and wait and see is always the most toxic way to approach any sort of progress. It's like when the gun fires at a race, and you just go, I'm going to see how the guy does first. I'm going to let him run a little bit. And then if it looks like he's running well, I'm going to try to pass him. It, that's, you have to, you'd have to go. As soon as you see Netflix arrive, the, the thing should be, okay, Netflix is going to be here in 25 years. That's, that's definitive. It, or something similar to Netflix. So we might as well try to see how we can get in on that. And the CEO of Netflix came out earlier this year and he talked with the French government. And they laid the, the hand down and they said, you are going to pay our cultural taxes on all of your content. And that's how it's going to be. And they said, well, I mean, we don't have to do that. We can just go to Luxembourg and, and, and get money from you from Luxembourg. And you guys have an agreement with Luxembourg that means we can sell things to your client, to your to, to French citizens without paying your cultural tax. So we either do that or you or you bend your rule a little bit. And, and now they're in Luxembourg. A point conceded, I think, by the new French culture minister who said the problem's more with the EU rules uh, mm. than it is uh, with the companies we've been mentioning in this show. I want to thank our panel. I want to thank uh, Liam Bogart. I want to thank as well uh, Jacob Hessler, Emmanuel Vivier, and Etienne Drouard. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you for joining us here in the France Fanquette debate.